what does that sound like to you? I'm here you saying death, the ending of life, yes? To me, that's the sound of life starting, my life. And because of that sound, I've been able to live into an incredible meaning. I was born with a heart defect so severe, the doctors pronounced me dead at birth. After minutes of resuscitation efforts, I came back on my own. The doctors noted that I seemed to show signs of thriving when my mom was around. Despite my signs of thriving, they said that my heart was very sick and unfixable, and that I had minutes to live. Well, those minutes turn into hours, those hours turn into days, those days turn into weeks, those weeks turn into months, and at six months, the doctor wrote, miracle, across my charts, because they couldn't explain how I was still alive. But I know how. And maybe, just maybe, the very thing that got my heart restarted can get your heart restarted as well. Here begins our journey. Now, at the age of three, I began to have a recurring dream, a repetitive dream. And during this time, I knew that my life expectancy was 12 years old. And during this dream, I was going through a series of challenges, only to wind up in this big grassy field with a bright, bold sunshine that I was chasing down. Now, as I, as I was running towards this sun, I would stop, turn around and say, I've got to go back. I've got something left to do. Well, I didn't tell anyone about this dream for a while, maybe until about the age of eight, and then I shared it with a family friend. And he said, Julie, that's your soul talking to you. Your soul is trying to tell you that you still have to figure out what your meaning is. Well, those are pretty big concepts for an eight-year-old, and I'm not quite sure I understood that. But interestingly enough, at this same time, I met my fifth grade gym teacher. And he taught me that the heart is a muscle, and if you use it, you can strengthen it. And he believed that I could heal my heart, and he encouraged me to start running. Well, I wasn't sure about this. The doctor said that I would only be able to do light activity at best. But there was something about the sparkle in his eye when he looked at me and said, I believe in you, kid. You're going to do some great things. That made me want to try. And so I began to run. And at the age of 12, I woke up and lived. And not only did I live, but the doctors marveled at how my heart seemed to be healing itself. In fact, they progressed my life expectancy from 12 to 18 to 24. And at 24, I decided that I'd run my first marathon. And I picked a marathon that would benefit a cancer charity, and I picked one in Alaska. Because I thought, well, if I'm going to die doing this, I might as well do it in a place where no one I know will have to witness it. But I didn't die that day, although there were moments in time that I felt like I was going to. At mile 24, I got to that point where my legs started to feel like rubber. My brain was no longer connected to my body, and I thought, God, I have gone far enough. For a girl whose heart was never supposed to do anything more than light physical activity, 24 miles is great. I'm good. If you need me to keep going for any reason at all, I need a sign right now, because elsewise, I'm going to stop. I'm good. And out of nowhere, a spectator appeared holding this big, bright yellow sign that said, thank you for running. I'm a survivor. You give my life meaning. Well, of course, I couldn't stop. I had to keep going, and I did cross the finish line that day. And when I crossed that finish line that day, did I not only not die, but perhaps I started to live for the first time. Because you see, when I crossed that finish line, I knew that I had been given the gift of a second chance at life. But a gift is only as good as what you do with it. So on my flight home from Alaska, I charted out a life plan. Yes, I decided that I was going to change the course of my life and pay forward on this gift that I'd received by helping others with their second chance at life and helping to heal their hearts through health and wellness. But in order to do this, I was going to have to leave my job, go back to school, take some chances and some risks that didn't have any certainties behind them, no guarantees on how the story would end there. But somehow I knew that when I was following my meaning, when I was listening to my heart, it would just work out. And it did. The moment I started to live into my meaning, listening to my heart, 
doors opened where I only knew walls stood before. Impossible dreams became beautiful realities. Ideas on paper became brick and mortar. Yes, and even the doctors looked at my heart and they said, we don't see any of the damage that she was born with. Her heart is nearly perfect. She's going to live a normal, healthy life. Yes, all these things happen and people would say, you're so lucky. Things just happen for you. But I think luck has nothing to do with this. I think that when you're following your meaning, life just shows you the way. But I'm not the first person to talk about this. No, back in 1946, Viktor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning, in which he talked about being in a concentration camp during World War II. And he said the thing that saved his life was his desire to find meaning in his life. He later went on to be a psychiatrist in which he helped his patients to find meaning through logotherapy. And logotherapy is this idea that far greater than power or pleasure is our desire to find meaning in this world. And current research backs up this idea. In a recent study, hospital janitors were interviewed about what they like the most about their job. Now, the job as a hospital janitor is one of the most important jobs in the world. They help to get rid of uh, biohazardous waste. But it's probably not always the most glamorous job at times. And so when they were asked what gave them joy about their job, what did they like the most, they said, we love helping the patients to heal. We love telling them a joke, making them laugh, helping them to feel better. When a patient is getting a shot, we'll do a little dance in the background to try to get their mind off of it. So why is it that the janitor said that the thing that they love the most about what they did, the thing that got them out of bed every morning, is something that you would not find on their job description, nor was it something that they would get paid for? It's because it gave their work more meaning. Yes, it gave their work more meaning. And so you might be thinking, I hear you. I get the whole idea about meaning, but you know, my life is good. You know, I pay my bills. Maybe it's not exciting, but I get by in this life just fine. Well, what if you could wake up every morning springing out of bed so excited to begin your day because you knew it was going to be an extraordinary day? Or what if you knew even your worst day you'd be able to conquer with boldness and courage? Well, you can and I'm going to give you three steps that you can start today in order to live into your meaning. Number one, listen to your heart. My heart spoke to me for 24 years before I would listen to it. In fact, it came to me in my dreams. And ironically, you know, the last time I had that dream was the night before that marathon. Perhaps once I figured out how to live into my meaning, my heart knew it didn't need to keep reminding me, so the dream stopped. But for whatever it is, our heart knows. Listen to it. What does your heart whisper to you? Number two, start with small acts. You don't have to go out and quit your day job. In fact, please don't do that. But start with something small. If you love animals, begin by volunteering at your local animal shelter. If you like to write, offer to start a newsletter at your office where you can write about topics that you're passionate about. Because what you'll find are those small things, well, they become the big things. And number three, find something meaningful each day. At first, you have to think about it. Ask yourself, what was meaningful about today? What can I do today that would be meaningful? And consistently practice this, because the more you practice it, it becomes a habit. And a habit is something that you no longer have to think about. It's just a part of what you do or who you are. So you create a meaningful life on purpose. So some of you are sitting there thinking, I love your message, but it's not for me. You don't understand my life. I'm at a low point, financially, maybe health-wise, relationships, my job. This is for someone else. I don't have time to focus on meaning right now. If that's you, then I'd like you to meet Corey. I met Corey because I'm a volunteer wish granter for an organization that grants wishes for children with life-threatening illnesses. And Corey was diagnosed with cancer. The day that I met Corey, I walked into his house to interview him about what it was that his wish would be. And when I met him, he opened the door. He greeted me so warmly, and he cracked a joke right away. He was bigger than life. He was one of those people that everybody just wanted to be friends with. Mr. Charisma, if you will. And he had wanted to be a professional baseball player one day. 
Well, fast forward six months. I'm standing at Corey's bedside in the hospital, and he's sleeping. Corey had his leg amputated because the doctors had hoped to contain the cancer from his leg so it wouldn't spread, but that didn't work. Corey was sweating because his amputation had become infected. And because of the sweating, he had broken into a rash. Corey had lost all his hair, and he had gained water weight because of all the medication that was being pumped through his body. I stood over Corey, and I, I cried. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and I saw his face smiling at me, and he said, Julie, why are you crying? You know this was my purpose. This was my life's meaning. Some people spend their whole life looking for it. But in 14 short years, I found it. I meant to show people how no matter what's going on in your life, you can live with power and courage and humor and peace. Don't ever feel sorry for me. I've lived a full life. So I left there that day, and I got in my car, and I cried that ugly cry. And I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I don't understand. Why was I given a second chance at life? And this boy who is somebody who I think could have saved the world, why wasn't he? And she said, Julie, it's really simple. His work is finished but you still have work left to do. And so do you. I called Corey's sister recently to let her know that I'd be giving this talk and to ask permission to share Corey's story. And one of the things she remarked is that he had only told one family friend that when he got better, he wanted to become a motivational speaker because he wanted to share his story. I didn't know this before. So that made me being able to share his story today even more powerful. Listen to your heart. Start with small acts. Find something meaningful each and every day. And if you do these things, you'll make meaning your compass in your life. You'll restart your heart, and you'll live an extraordinarily joyful life. Thank you.